And this one, as I say, still... Oh, oh dear. Oh, shit. Well, hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel. And lately I've been doing quite a lot of thinking and I've been thinking that in this world, there's not that many bargains anymore. There's not that many luxurious things that were once very expensive that can be had for an affordable price. I think the cost of everything is just going up. But, you know, for example, I've always wanted one of those really fancy Italian coffee machines. They're like two grand. And you go onto the used market and you find a 10 year old one and it's still like 1700 quid. OK, there are some bargains to be had. Famously, the British Airways 747 sold to Cotswold Airport, which once cost 250 million pounds new, was sold to Cotswold Airport for just one pound. Now, that's some serious depreciation. However, there are some more everyday available bargains that we can buy as consumers, such as cars. And case in point right next to me is a gorgeous 2006 L322 supercharged Range Rover with a 4.2 litre V8 engine. When these were new, their list price was around 60 grand back in the mid noughties. And plus options, most of these were advertised at around £70,000 new, which if you adjust for inflation today is very near to £100,000. Yet, these can be picked up for as little as four or five grand. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? So should we all be going out and buying L322 Range Rovers then? Well, as the age old saying goes, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And there are many, many disadvantages to buying and owning something like this. But we should first talk about all of the positives of owning such a car like this. I think with a Range Rover badge, that does afford you some sort of status level, which is something that many of us crave, whether we care to admit it or not. But for me, it's not about that at all. It's about the way in which these things drive on the road, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this review. Many of you watching will probably know what I'm talking about if you either A, own an L322 Range Rover or have driven one. But the ones I'm talking to here is in Group C who've never experienced one of these, never owned one of them. Until you drive one, you won't understand this, that there is just something about these L322s that gets underneath your skin. It's hard to explain, but it is for me, I think, in just the way it sits on the road, its boxy shape, how easy it is to point each corner where you want to go. It just makes you feel very, very happy and actually, for me, relaxed, which is something that's hard to get on the roads these days. They're so congested, so busy. Everyone's trying to switch lanes and get where they want to go faster. In a Range Rover, you don't get that. You get the opposite. It makes you want to drive slower. It makes you calmer. It makes you a more considerate driver. And these are all things that I really enjoy about the experience of driving a Range Rover. But most importantly, if you want that experience in something new today, let's say you wanted a brand new Range Rover, you are going to be spending well in excess of £100,000. And you can go back and see my brutally honest reviews with both the new Range Rover and Range Rover Sports. I wouldn't say they're necessarily worth every penny of that and certainly pound for pound buying something like this the value is absolutely unmatchable the l322 range rover did come in many different shapes and sizes but first if i may whilst we're stood out here i want to just talk about the way this thing looks because for me that is something that is lost with the newer models i do love the way the newer range rovers look don't get me wrong and even the generation before this the l45 i thought that was a very pretty and well balanced car but there again it's just something about the boxy straight edge nature of this L322 which appeals to me and I think many of you watching as well. It has this rugged feel that the newer cars simply just don't. In fact, a little bit like my KM that I currently own, it's my 955 2005 generation car. It has that same sort of tactile feeling to it which I think is lost on many newer cars these days. And so yeah, this one in particular, being a supercharged, it has these clear lights at the back which I actually really like supercharged badging too. This one, the owner is very proud to tell me, has a apparently rare Thule tow bar. I think I got that right, but if you know, you know. And this one very tastefully specs actually. It's black on black, which I think lots of the supercharged models were. Tinted windows, a bit of a no-no if you ask me, but actually when you're driving the car, it is a nice thing to have. And actually just to match the interior, which is also black, 
it does work very, very well. This one does have non-standard wheels on, they're actually 21 inch wheels, but again, given the whole gangster look of this car, I think it works really, really well. So regarding displacement choices with the L322, the options were actually quite numerous. When this first came out in 2001, 2002, you could either have a 4.4 litre V8, which I used to own actually in my first L322 Range Rover. Great engine, the BMW block M62, had its problems, but it was a lovely, lovely engine. Or you could have the three litre TD6, which I think at its time served its purpose, but now has gained a reputation of being, well, very noisy and clackety and just slightly not enough for a car of this size. That produced sort of under 200 horsepower and apparently used to be quite labored trying to get anywhere with that engine in this car. I've never actually experienced one of those cars, but generally speaking, the three litre TD6 is one to avoid. Later on in life then, 2005 came round, they brought out this, which was the 4.2 litre V8 supercharged engine. This is a Jaguar block, which is renowned as being one of the great engines. It's found in the XK8 of the time, or the XKs I should say, from Jaguar and a few other cars too. But namely, it's supercharged and it produces around 385 horsepower, which as I'll get onto a little bit later on, comes with some pretty significant disadvantages. They did also update that 4.4 litre V8 block to another Jaguar unit, a slightly more powerful petrol 300 horsepower V8. Apparently that is the sweet spot of these early engines. And then later on they updated the diesel to be a 3.6 litre TD V8, which I also used to own and that is a fantastic engine and you'll find the likes of Jeremy Clarkson and Harry Metcalf swearing by that engine and still owning cars with that engine in their L322s today. Then 2009 comes round, they updated this 4.2 litre V8 supercharged to a five litre supercharged engine producing 500 horsepower with which I'm yet to experience and would love to. And then the 4.4 TD V8 finally in 2011 replaced the 3.6 and that's what the L322 went out with. So there are a lot of options when it comes to L322 then. And of all of the ones I've mentioned ranging from 2002 all the way to the end of production in 2012, 2013, any one of those cars can be had for way under 10 grand now, right up to the five litre supercharged ones. Yes, a ropey one, but you can get any of those cars within a 10 grand budget, which is just quite miraculous. But it does present the obvious question of where on earth do you go? Where do you start? And where do you begin? But today we are gonna be focusing on this, the 4.2 litre V8 supercharged model one that I've been really, really keen to drive. Like I say, I've driven pretty much most of the other ones, not the five litre, and that's it actually, not the three litre TD6. But the 4.2 supercharged one has something I've almost bought before. It's something I've been really, really keen to get underneath and, and to understand. So today in this brutally honest review, that's exactly what I'm gonna aim to do. Right, well, jumping up or climbing up, should I say, into the L322 then. And I have to be honest, this is where I start to get quite giddy and excited because these things are just packed full of quirky features. And it starts right here with how I've just sat down and the armrests. This is one thing I always say about my KN that I currently drive and I will stop banging on about that car, but it is just an armrest short of being perfect is what I say to my wife because these are just the greatest driving thing ever. Being able to drive along, with your elbow resting on here, it really does, and it's such a cliche, and it's been overused many times, but it feels like you're sat at home in your armchair whilst you drive along. Also, a feature of these early L322s and Range Rovers that have come after is just the big flat glass panels on the side windows and the windscreen in front. It means the views you get as you're driving around are just unrivaled with anything else that I can think of. In terms of the actual seats themselves, they are very, very comfortable as you would expect. And even after 18 years in this car's example, the leather is still very, very soft, cushioning, very supple, and just shows that it was built properly the first time. Also, in terms of the adjustment on, the, on these seats, there's, there's much you can do, such as electronically adjusting the headrest up and down, which is nice. But also, this is rare on cars these days. You can actually individually fold two parts of the seat. So the upper part of the seat, you can recline and bring up separately to the main backrest, which just means for any shape and size of person, you will find a very comfortable driving position 
in your L322. The cabin feels large and spacious too, which is great because on many newer cars that are just as big, if not bigger than this car, you get inside and you just think, where on earth is all of this space gone? Many of you will know what I'm talking about, especially in the back. The headline seems to just fall away and there's no leg room, whereas the L322 is fantastically proportioned both inside and outside too. You have this gorgeous stitching along the top of the dashboard and down here along the side of the doors too, which as with the seats has worn impeccably. And then the steering wheel, so, so simple, but yet such a great shape. Always feels so good to hold the wheel of a Range Rover. And on this one, as with all supercharged, you've got the heated wheel as standard cruise control. And then you have some controls here, which would control your CD player and things like that. This L322 has slightly different dials to what I've experienced before because it's the supercharged. So you have a 6,000 RPM red line and you have the word supercharged written in the middle, which is very, very inviting indeed. Also, despite this being a 2006 car, you've got automatic headlights, which is a feature you'd find in most new things, of course, electronically adjustable wing mirrors. And my personal favorite thing with, with most cars, actually, I love this, just an electronically adjustable steering column. That is such a lovely touch. And it's one of those ones that's automatic too. So when you do get in and out of the car, so when you park the car and stop, the wheel will automatically move away from you and vice versa. It's just a lovely extra thing to have and just makes this car feel as expensive as its original price tag. Moving down here then, we do have a couple of controls for various off-road features of this car. Now, early L322s, i.e. up to, I think, 2008, just had standard low-range gearbox setting and a hill descent control, plus the normal air suspension. Later on, there was a control wheel added. I think my 2008 car had this, where you could choose between different programs, as they call it, so mud ruts or gravel or sand or snow, which just added a little bit more complexity, but also diversity to how you could control the car specifically to what you were driving on. But in this car, it's very simple. We have the gear shifter, which is our six speed automatic gearbox. We have the low range, we have the hill descent. We can also flick this across to manual and shift with the shifter here manually. And then moving on to the center, we have beautiful Land Rover clock. We have a button for the boot, for the parking sensors to be activated or deactivated. Our traction control and here, the infamous air suspension, which I always love on these earlier models, having the toggle switch like this, as opposed to the later ones, which had a button. And very importantly, you do have a button here on the right hand side near your wing mirror, which if you press it once as you're coming to a stop, I think anywhere under 20 miles per hour, will lower the car into access mode, which is such a lovely feature, just being able to tap that here, watch the car glide on down to the floor, making it easier for you to step out. That's when it's working because the air suspension can be, well, it, it is a problem with these cars. It does go wrong, but these cars are in lots of cases over 20 years old now. And if they're not maintained like any newer car would be, of course, air suspension is going to fail. And because of what it is, it is quite expensive once it does. We'll talk a little bit more about reliability and maintenance later on. Moving on with what we have on this central control panel though, we have the air conditioning and climate controls. Again, just so tactile and feel and so well designed. As people have probably told you before, these were designed at the time so that anyone driving this car with gloves on could still operate all of the controls. And it does feel that way. It's so, so refreshing having done brutally honest reviews so far with only new vehicles. A sticking point of all of those videos and reviews has been the fact that you have to control all of the features in terms of air conditioning and infotainment or driving modes from a central screen coming away and stepping into this older L322 is so, so lovely because we have proper big chunky buttons for our climate control and a big press button for our heated seats. Very simple, very effective, but still 20 years later, very satisfying to use. Just onto a few other quirky things inside here though, specifically, this car still has the original, look at this, I've never seen this before the original Nokia phone for the car. So this plugs in down here 
And then once that's connected, you can use the infotainment screen to dial, go through your contacts and have phone calls. But also the phone can be removed and used separately. And look, it's got a 1.3 megapixel camera on the back. Gosh, that takes me back. I remember getting my first phone with a two megapixel camera and thinking that I could change the world or something. This is quite a throwback indeed. And it still has the remote for the TVs, which I think this car has in the back. I, I can't remember if this remote does those TVs in the back. I believe it does, but I think it would also be able to control the front screen too. Speaking of other lovely things with this particular car, this still has the original Land Rover torch, which is stored just here in the passenger's footwell. And most people don't know this about their L322s. I've seen many people actually don't realize there are, or is, a cup holder that folds out very eloquently from the center here. It's hidden away, and on both of the ones I've had, it's either not worked or not worked properly. But this one, still working very, very well indeed and is adjustable like this. It's probably the most over-engineered cup holder ever. But so you do have the big deep one there, but you've also got this one, which will fit smaller, more fragile cups. And this one's still working properly. And that is testament to the owner of this car, who does tell me he has spent a small fortune keeping this thing in tip-top shape. But a lot of that money was spent on some subframe work, which if you have owned one of these cars, you will know about. In fact, one of my cars succumbed to rust. Um, that is an issue with these things. It bubbles up on the arches and underneath the car. Also on the rear upper tailgate is quite a common spot. And although this does have a little bit of bubbling here and there, most of that heavy work has already been undertaken. But this is the thing, okay? This is the thing with these cars and these Range Rovers that get such a bad reputation. Because yes, they can be bought very very cheaply however what people seem to forget is that although they're bought cheaply they are still inherently a 70 80 90 000 pound car and so when you're planning on maintaining or running or servicing one of them you should be thinking of it in that way see the cost of buying the car will come down over time but the cost of maintenance actually if anything increases the parts are always going to be the same price it doesn't matter if the car was once 90 grand and is now nine grand it doesn't mean the parts will be a tenth of what they once were the parts stay a fixed cost and so i think a large part of the reason that these cars do tend to go wrong fairly frequently and therefore suffer from a quite negative reputation is because they do fall into the wrong hands they fall into the likes of people that can afford to buy the cars but not putting away two to three thousand pounds a year to maintain them properly and what i've realize and experience over years of owning quite difficult cars at times is that if you do put the money in and do all the preventative maintenance and keep on top of things keep to the service schedule even 120 130,000 miles down the line then these cars do not throw up that many issues yes there's going to be the odd glitch here and there that it might show you but inherently these are quite well built cars and when they are maintained properly they don't tend to cause you all that much trouble. But that's not to say it's not still going to be very expensive. It's just much better to pay the money up front and get it done ahead of the car going wrong, if that makes sense. So I do think these do suffer from a reputation, rightly so, because they are expensive when they go wrong and they do go wrong fairly frequently. But I think if every person that ran one of these actually put money aside and looked after them properly, the reputation wouldn't be half as bad. So we do have a great and working sunroof, which 90% of L322s will have, and all L322s will have this, which is the double visor situation. Very, very handy indeed on the rare, seldom sunny days like this we have in the UK. But let's quickly pop the ignition on and talk about the tech or the infotainment that we have in this car. Of course, with this being a earlier car the ignition barrel is still down here on the central console something i <laughs> embarrassingly forgot about earlier trying to stick the key into the dashboard here so turning the car on then and we're immediately greeted by the fuel and temperature page on the infotainment screen conveniently telling us that our long-term fuel average is 14.1 miles per gallon we'll talk about that a little bit later on but this won't take long because there's not too much this car we've got the main page here where we can adjust the clock down here and also on here, we can change our units, whether we wanna be in miles or kilometers, Celsius, Fahrenheit, etc. We can make changes to our voice recognition settings and also the screen 
brightness and display settings. And we do have this fantastic four by four page where we can access cameras, but we can also look at what the car is doing, which mode it's in, whether it's in hill descent, whether it's in standard ride height or something else. And if we click this compass button, it tells us compass not available, but there was at one point a lovely compass there too. We have an original sat nav in this car, which I always love to see. It's always a bit of a throwback. And actually in my last L322, it didn't work. So it's quite nice to see this. I think it's the first time I've actually seen it. I'm sure 90% of the roads in Britain are probably not on here, but if you're trying to get from point A to point B, it'll probably do half a job. But what I'm just finding in general is that the screen and the functionality of this infotainment system is so straightforward and so simple and probably more straightforward and easier to use than 99% of the modern stuff. This being the supercharged model, it comes with the best sound system at the time, the Harman Kardon Logic 7, and it is an utterly brilliant system actually. But if you do want to listen to your own music, it's a little bit difficult. This doesn't come with Bluetooth, so you can't connect your phone for the purpose of music. You have to use CDs or find an aftermarket solution, maybe a Bluetooth adapter or something that goes into your cigarette port, like a FM transmitter, for example. But when you do have your music playing or your CD in, if you like to be old school, it does sound brilliant. And that's about all there is to the infotainment system. You can also watch DVDs on this front screen. We'll have a quick look at the back too, which has the TV screens in it, but you can watch a DVD while stationary in the front of the car. And then in terms of the driver's display, well, of course, we've got analog dials with the big supercharged on the rev counter and our speedo fuel and water temperature on the right. And then we can scroll using the button on the end of the stalk here to see the time, the date, our horrendous fuel consumption, our range, which is always lower than you want it to be, and our average speed. And that's just about it in the back of the supercharged L322 then. And as I hinted at in the front of the car, it's so spacious. I mean, it's just lovely in here. There's plenty and plenty of leg room, even when the seat is quite far back. We have heated seats in the back, which is a really nice touch, and TV screens, which is lovely. And again, this one has been kept very well and been looked after, which means, and I've never seen this actually in a car that I've had or reviewed, it still has the original, I think they're original, headphones. But certainly I've never seen these in the back of an L322 before. Great and properly made sturdy seat pockets here. And there's some controls here for an AUX input. And I think you could literally plug your Xbox into that back in the day and play on your Xbox in the back of the car. Then if we fold this down, you have the very useful cup holders which extend out from the back there. And of course, this can be folded down to then gain access to the boot, which, as I'll show you very shortly, is large. And there's really nothing you can put in the back of this thing, especially if you fold the seats down. But I have to say, just yet, yeah, sat in the back of here, it's so lovely. It's so, so nice and comfortable. And it wouldn't be a Range Rover review, would it, if we didn't at least open or look at the split folding tailgate, which is just a staple of any Range Rover, really. Something you still get today on the full-size version, and also so much space. This one has an OEM mat or load space cover in it as well, which is nice, and a net. Never seen that before, but that's actually really clever. And yeah, you can basically get anything in there. And if you put the seats down too, you've just got a gargantuan amount of storage space. And also conveniently, I like that from the back here where we're standing, I get a glimpse of the twin tailpipes underneath, telling us that this is indeed the 4.2 litre supercharged model. And I think with that then, it's probably a great time and opportunity now to get behind the wheel and take this thing out for a drive and see what this supercharged model is all about. Right, so here we are then, my first experience in a supercharged Range Rover. And on a personal level, I have to say, it's just so lovely to be back in an L322. As I said earlier on in the video, there is just something about these cars, which is it's hard to describe to someone that hasn't experienced one. 
it's hard to put into words, but it, you just feel really warm inside when you are behind the wheel of an L322. It's a really lovely feeling that I'm yet to really experience in, in much else. And I will say the KN doesn't give me that same level of warmth as, as one of these does. So anyway, it's fantastic to be back behind the wheel of a car that I'm oh so familiar with as a platform, but with an engine that I have access to under my right foot that I'm not familiar with at all. And if we just have a little bit of a glimpse of what this thing's about, put it into third gear at 3000 RPM. I'm just gonna go half throttle, listen. Can you hear that? That faint whine as the supercharger kicks in. It's really addictive. So in drive then and bumbling along these country roads and for all intents and purposes, this supercharged Range Rover just drives like any other Range Rover. It's really, really good at absorbing up the minor and frequent imperfections in our British roads. It does get a little bit bothered and disturbed every now and then by a sharper pothole or a bigger crack in the road. But all in all, it rides tremendously well. With this armrest, with these lazy boy style seats, it's super, super easy and second nature to just drive along in this thing and eat up the miles without a care in the world. I've got fantastic visibility out of all corners of the car, thanks to the large glass, the great mirrors on the side, and look at the views out, which here is just spectacular. So there's really nothing apart from the supercharged text in front of me on my rev counter to suggest that there's anything particularly special under that big bonnet in front of me. But it doesn't take much to be reminded. First and foremost, when approaching a corner, the brakes are way sharper than I was expecting. They feel really good. They've got a proper bite to them. And I'm sure that's testament to how well this particular car has been maintained. But you've got real confidence in the stopping power of this car, despite the fact it's a big old beast. And then you exit the corner and you put your foot down and you're met with a equal feeling of surprise how, how this thing goes. I have to say, before coming into this review, 385 odd horsepower, a 7.2-ish second, naught to 60 time. I wasn't expecting to be impressed particularly by the performance of this thing, but I was wrong because ignore those on paper figures. When you're actually behind the wheel and you're sat this high up and you plant the throttle, you get the sound of that supercharger accompanied by the digits of the speedo passing by very fast. I don't care what the paper says, it feels a lot quicker than that. This is the only Range Rover I've ever driven where I'd even consider and actually enjoy putting the gearbox into sports mode and selecting my own gears. Let me give you some idea of what I mean. So we're at 30 miles per hour, 3000 RPM, second gear, I'm gonna plant it. There's 60, and the power is instantaneous. Once you're in the rev band, it doesn't take any time at all for that supercharger to get you going. The difficulty comes though, when you do approach a corner after accelerating like that, and it very quickly becomes apparent that you are still in a boxy old L322 Range Rover. There doesn't feel to be anything particularly different with this supercharged model to mitigate any of that body roll or to make you feel any more attached or planted to the road. And of course, you can only defy the laws of physics to a certain extent, so what do you expect? But I certainly wouldn't be approaching a supercharged Range Rover expecting to be able to thrash it within an inch of its life down some B roads like this because it doesn't disguise the fact that it is a big, tall Range Rover when you hit a corner at speed. That's not to say you can't have fun though. You know, you can pin it into a corner and it grips pretty well. And like I say, these brakes are absolutely astonishing. Downshifting in a Range Rover down into second gear. Never thought I'd be doing that in an L322. Bit of power on the brakes, turn in, power through. Yeah, and a car this old, this heavy, this tall, shouldn't perform that well. So it is possible to have fun in this thing when you put your foot down, but 
there's no hiding from the fact of what it is. It feels like my old 4.4 V8 or even like my 3.6 TD V8 in the way that it handles the road. However, the funny thing is, the fuel needle goes backwards almost as quickly as the speed needle goes up when you do put your foot down. I don't think I've ever experienced a car with such poor fuel economy. And I know it's obvious, isn't it? It's a 4.2 litre V8 supercharged Range Rover weighing well in excess of two tonnes. So what do you expect? But I didn't expect it to be this bad. So for some context, the owner of this car drives it regularly and he does admit to me that he really does make the most of the power and he thrashes it all the time. But he does also do a pretty long 150 mile round trip journey to London every other week. And his average, his long term average in this car is 14.14 miles per gallon. And to be honest, in my head, I was thinking, surely, surely you can get a lot better than that because I've managed to drive a V12 7 Series from Scotland to London on one tank of fuel, averaging around 27 miles per gallon. Heck, in my TD V8 Range Rover, I averaged almost 40 miles per gallon going to Scotland and back on one tank of fuel. But today, driving around, and I've not really been putting my foot down all that much until I started filming, I've done a little bit of sitting idling whilst I set some cameras up. But all in all, I've averaged 12 miles per gallon so far driving today, over around 50 miles or so. And that's really quite bad, isn't it? The thing is, when this car came out almost 20 years ago now, we were in a very different place. Efficiency wasn't really a thing that most people considered. To be honest, fuel back then was less than a pound a litre. So even if it was something you thought about, 20, 15 or maybe 25 miles per gallon wouldn't sound so bad because it just simply wouldn't cost you as much. But in this day and age where the average unleaded is £1.50, £1.60 for super, to fill this car up is going to cost you that times 10 and you're only going to get around 350 to 400 miles per tank. It is quite bad and I've always been the first to say, you know what, just buy the car you want and fill it up and just enjoy it. But I think at that level, you really do have to consider whether it's worth it. So, is the supercharged worth it? My main problem with this car so far is that although that power plant should be the eighth wonder of the world, it really is truly spectacular. It doesn't really make sense in this car. Now certainly there's nothing wrong with having a Range Rover like this that's fast in a straight line, and this certainly is. And I can think of many times on my normal commutes and journeys where it would be really useful and enjoyable to have all that power. But the issue for me is that when you get to a corner, it just doesn't perform in the same way. The handling and the responsiveness of the rest of the car doesn't keep up with that of the engine. Now I know there's a million and one brilliant sports cars that can be bought for the same sort of price as this, which would do a far better job in all respects. But the truth of the matter is people like big cars. You know, I like SUVs and especially today, lots of manufacturers are making fast performance SUVs. But for me, the L322 Range Rover really does suit a diesel engine. And I don't think anyone's really arguing with that. I mean, here we're going up a hill and despite having almost 400 horsepower, the car is having to hunt for gears whilst at the lower RPMs due to a lack of lower down torque. Whereas in a diesel car, that would be far more flawless. No, you wouldn't have that same exhilaration when you get higher up in the rev band, but you'd also be averaging twice the MPG. So it'd be much better on your wallet. I think if I own this car, I'd find it quite hard to know what to do. Like right now, I feel like I should be putting my armrest up whacking it into sport on the gearbox and thrashing it because I've got the supercharged. But then everything else about the car when you're going down the road tells you that you should just be in drive, you should have it all set up nice and comfortably and you should have your armrest down and just bumble along. But you feel kind of guilty for not using all the power that's there. If you have an itch to scratch with an L322, then I would probably point you towards 
a diesel. However, if you're desperate to get your hands and to have one of these supercharged cars, it is easy to forget about the Range Rover Sport, which they obviously did with this engine. And I feel like that, with its slightly more dynamic characteristics, might be a better pairing. And you do get 80 to 90% of the refinements as you do in this full-size car with the Sport. But I feel like you would benefit from that engine maybe 50 or 60% more than you do in this. So potentially, if you're after a 4.2 supercharged car, you should go and look an L320 Range Rover Sport. That might be, that might be the sweet spot. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think the fact that you can get such an accomplished car like this that once was six figures for peanuts in comparison, you know, seven or eight grand for a looked after one, is really fantastic and despite all the shortcomings that I've mentioned you know when it comes to fuel economy and things like that actually when you think about the purchase price it's not all that bad you're gonna to have to spend tens and tens of thousands more than that to get something as accomplished as quick as comfortable but that also return you a better fuel consumption so really when you look at it like that these things are a true bargain and I think that extends across the entire range. But this supercharged does just give you that extra zest that you might be missing from the diesel or smaller petrol models. And on maintenance too, as I said earlier, I think if you keep on top of it and you put aside one, 2,000 pounds a year potentially, I know it's a lot of money, but it's much better to preemptively get things sorted or to just have the money available when something goes wrong. You lose that anxiety every time you start the car or every time you're on a drive and you're wondering when the next warning light's gonna come on. I feel like if you have a little bit of a kitty to the side, one to 2,000 pounds, that anxiety sort of disappears because you're not really worried about something going wrong because if it does, you just get it fixed. And truthfully, and this might sound a bit harsh, and actually I could certainly take some of my own advice from past mistakes I've made, if you can't afford to have that one or two thousand pound a year kitty, you probably shouldn't buy one of these cars because it will cost you money to keep it in tip top shape. And it shows a car like this one from today's owner that has been really looked after and has had thousands spent on it in a few years, it will reward you for it. It gives you a fantastic driving experience, I would say on par with a car that's 10 times more valuable if you bought it new today. So that for me is the truth with Range Rovers and I don't think they're always deserving of this unreliable rhetoric that's thrown around constantly. Maybe with the newer stuff when it's going back in after a year for something major, you know, that shouldn't be happening. But these are 20 year old cars now, these L322s, anywhere from 22 years to 15, 16 years old in general. And of course things are gonna go wrong on them. And of course it's gonna be a little bit more expensive than a Peugeot 107 to repair when it does because these cars were so expensive when they were new. So for me, would I buy a 4.2 litre supercharged L322? Never say never, but I'd probably go for a diesel first, but it would be a crime against humanity if you guys watching went through the entirety of your lives without at least experiencing this engine, be it in this car or maybe a Jaguar because it truly is fantastic. So the L322 platform though, I mean, for me, it never gets old. In fact, I don't think it does get old because I think it's timeless. They already look pretty to me and I think they're only going to get better. Truth be told, despite there being so many engine options, when you buy one of these cars, you can't really buy a bad one because what you're buying is the platform. You're buying the seating position, you're buying this big glass and just the way it makes you feel when you sit behind the wheel that's what you're buying and if you want a bit of a thrill and you want to be able to put your foot down and that noise to happen then the 4.2 supercharged genuinely could be a great option it's not like anything else really i just love the simplicity of the controls everything's easy to touch with one thumb on the steering wheel and without even taking my elbow off the armrest, I can control my heated seats, my air conditioning, and literally anything I need to do without compromising my comfort in any way. And that for me is what these cars are all about. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this review. Let me say a big thank you to Chris, the owner of this particular car, for letting me use it and just enjoy it. It's been really nice for me to be back behind the wheel of one of these cars and potentially means I'm now gonna be back in the market for one, although I think once in the market, always in the market with cars like these. I never stop looking for a nice one. Let me know what car you'd like to see me feature next. And if you've got something sat on your driveway that you think you'd like to see me do a brutally honest review on, then do get in touch via the email on the screen now or down in the description below. Send me an email and we'll get something sorted. Thank you all so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.